Okay, welcome back everyone. I know everyone's not back here from coffee yet, but um, uh, we do have a tight schedule, so I think we'd better uh, stick to that. So we've now got nine speakers um, in quick succession, so I'm going to be a bit uh, stricter with the um, timekeeping from now on. Um, but first up is Alistair Channon, so Alistair, over to you. Okay, thanks, Jim. Uh, so, I'm uh, going to be talking about normalised and literary activity statistics. I'm particularly really coming around to a conclusion of need for greater phenotypic evidence, um, so being able to see things in these systems. Uh, the workshop was set up with five key um, points that we ought to address, so I'm just going to address them in order. The first uh, point was really one of the key concepts um, concerning open and evolution. We had a theme of artificial life 2008. Well, we spent some time ahead of it. It wasn't a workshop, it was a theme, a series of papers. But in order to frame that, we spent some time trying to come up with what we thought open end evolution was, uh, something we disagree upon. And really, we had, there were two key ideas new attractive traits continue to evolve, and that there's a sustained increase in what we said at the time maximal, maximal complexity. I think there's a, an issue with that that I'll come back to later, and I think that something like median evolutionary activity, something like that, is, is a, a better choice, but there's this general idea that it's not just enough to be novelty, that there's got to be some other second criteria. It's quite easy to generate a system that just comes up with, with novelty. Um, and exactly what that, uh, that second criteria should be, I think, is, is one of the, the key things. And we've got versions from evolutionary activity statistics, like the median activity maybe should increase over time, or the total activity, and we've got ideas around complexity. And I'll come back to that in a bit. Uh, we were asked the same about models, so uh, my model um, uh, was essentially based on a, co a combination of different ideas from other people. Uh, it's around about uh, the mid-90s when Harvey's saga framework was becoming quite popular. It's a framework for long-term incremental evolution, it looks a bit more like biological evolution than a lot of the uh, uh, evolutionary algorithms that were around at the time. So it's uh, you know, processes that increase in the dimensionality of the search space, genotype starts short, uh, get longer, um, uh, driven mostly by mutations, so you have to operate in a framework where you have mutational pathways and neutral, neutral networks, as it were. And for that, uh, neural networks work quite well. Um, and we tend to be operating over many uh, millions, uh, correctly millions of millions uh, of reflective events, tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of generations. And so we, we tend to, for practical reasons, have fairly small population sizes. So you're pushed into those difficulties of being not crossing over error thresholds, critical mutation rates, those sorts of things, so you can maintain some diversity in your population. But that, of course, can be run just with a simple fitness function and, and evolution runs and, and stops. So uh, feedback is, uh, was the other ingredient. And we have examples that, um, around in the field, some really nice clear examples like this one, from Carl Sims, of how co evolutionary feedback might work. Of course, if you structure a, 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 a co evolutionary system such that you have some task for it, it will stop. So the key idea was to really get that feedback loop uh, to be one that would go on forever. So that, to try and set up um, uh, some, uh, some feedback that simply would uh, go on forever, whereby so genetics specifies behavior, specifies selection pressures, which could uh, which selects the, the genetics. So uh, that, that um, is really what biotic selection, natural selection is all about. And so that was the third key ingredient in that model. Um, but, uh, uh, so we have some nice ideas from it, and it happens to have some nice results that I'll talk about in a bit. 
But visually, it was a bunch of triangles running around on the screen, uh, which gives you very little to look at. Um, so visually, um, and you know, from a behavioral observation point of view, really quite poor. You can pull apart their neural controllers and you can try and look at them and see what's going on, but I'll come back to that in a bit. So when it comes to operational measures, uh, we have Mark Bello and colleagues um, evolutionary activity statistics. Um, and uh, I made one small contribution to that, but actually I think it's an important contribution. Um, it's essentially around about how we can do the normalization process. Um, so ordinarily with those, you have a, a real system running in, um, and you have a shadow system running, and you normalize at the end. It turns out that you can do that normalization uh, right down at component level, if you have your shadow especially being, being regularly reset. Um, you can then look at uh, what increases in uh, you know, of when you're observing components, so the raw activity increments uh, do you see in the real, what do you see in the shadow, take one from another and you instantly have a, essentially a measure for how active an individual, say, allele or whatever the component you're looking at is. I tend to be looking at alleles. Um, and just with that, um, you can then have your higher, light, higher metrics such as normalized diversity and median cumulative evolutionary activity. And those two things are enough really to address that, both that issue of novelty and that, uh, that issue of build-up, the two things that we might think we want to see in the evolutionary um, system. Uh, one of the nice things about these metrics, I mean, you know, uh, it's almost all about a uh, better, non um, uh, but they're incredibly easy to apply. So they really are very simple metrics, very, very general, which is it's worth, uh, worth remembering them. They do. It, this does bring up another question that relates back to that definition uh, again. Uh, there's a really interesting question. Once we have systems that are all very long times, maybe open-ended systems, one of the most interesting questions to ask is, do evolution, do open-ended evolving systems necessarily give rise to an increase in maximum complexity? It's a question that biologists pose in, um, uh, the biologists pose it in, is in, is it natural selection that's responsible for uh, increasing complexity? You simply can't ask that question if your definition of open-ended evolution is that you have a rise in maximum complexity. So if we, if we start including things about maximum complexity in the definition, we instantly lose our ability to say some very interesting things. Um, so I think that you know, having something like median evolutionary activity around is, a, is something alternative, and, and it's been known to feel longer, in fact, than, than your maximum complexity. It means you can ask the end of the evolution question, um, but, and then go on to ask questions about um, maximum complexity. Uh, okay. uh, so the empirical results of that system is it, it, achieved unbounded evolutionary dynamics. Uh, I wasn't very satisfied with the way the shadow system works, so I, I modified the statistics and, and, it, and it still did. But that's certainly not the end of the story. Um, uh, we, we really, uh, I, I think we could do a bit more of what I did there, really. Uh, the more systems we have that can pass a classification uh, for open evolution, the more we can say, well, what's lacking? Why are we not happy? Uh, what is it that maybe the classification system is missing? I'm going to have to hurry up and we'll uh, I've said already that weakness uh, in my system is that you can't really see what's going on. At the beginning, you can pull neural networks by, you can observe behaviors. Things chase each other, things catch each other, they share activity. Uh, they do all sorts of nice little behaviors, and you can see how the neural controllers link to that. But after a while, you've just got not a lot to look at to, in order to get a handle on what's going on. I'll skip this, but essentially, uh, I think looking at behaviors is, is probably key to it. Uh, hopefully, that gives me just a little time for my last slide. Um, uh, so milestones, I really say there's, there's three that, that seem very important to me. Uh, the more systems we can have being measured by whatever it is we agree uh, are classification systems, and, and uh, the better we'll be able to improve those classification systems. We need things that push the boundaries in order to say, actually, we're still unhappy. We need to, we need to modify the tests. And they are quite easy to apply. Uh, but more so, if, if we have in mind that we're going to be saying that these systems are keeping on evolving, uh, well, we ought to be able to see the products of that. We ought to be able to see what behaviors and what artifacts are coming out. And that, that's a nice thing to see, but I think crucial, in fact, are that we ought to be able to see sequences of, of evolution. So we ought to be able to see the A evolves and B evolves and C evolves and D evolves. And it's a little shocking to me, at least, that we don't have yet some sort of nice long sequences. I can think of examples of three or four long. I don't think I know of a single one that's seven long, for example. And, and having that as a major goal, it's, it's a nearer goal than open-ended evolution, but if, if we ought to be able to see within our systems these sequences of all our facts and things. Thanks. That used to be a four-hour talk. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks very much, Alex. Uh, maybe time for one question whilst the next speaker gets set up. Mark? I just have a quick uh, comment. Maybe it's about the slide that you skipped over. You were talking about uh, 
focusing on behaviors and phenotypic things. You yes. could attach activity statistics to those too. You can attach statistics, you know, the same statistics to these phenotypic features, oh, as yeah. long as you can measure them. Yes, yeah. So I, this is more I think about when we are actually. Um, so I, I think one thing we said at the previous conference really struck home to me is that you didn't feel you'd seen something uh, through, say, through my system. And I agree 100% with that. It's not just about the measures. I think we also need to be able to see it. And seeing artifacts, I don't think it makes a lot of sense. What I was going to say on this slide is, I don't think it makes a lot of sense to look at artifacts without looking at how they function, so without the behaviors. And it's really those behavioral descriptions that we'll, we'll need to, to satisfy ourselves that we're getting something in a way that when we look at the natural world, we see all these amazing things that are involved there. We need to be able to see them. Mm -hmm. That was my, my point, is that, that it's the behaviors, the functionality of the artifacts that we're interested to see. Yeah. Thanks okay. very much, Alistair. Okay, and our next speaker, Norman Packard. Hey, it's a real pleasure to be here. Um, I'm talking about a, a project that, that I'm doing primarily with Nicholas Gutenberg, but there are a variety of other collaborators at this uh, Earth Life Science Institute, a new institute that's studying modeling of uh, the origins of life. And, and um, uh, the there's a, a few uh, precursors to this work that I wanted to give pointers to um, uh, regarding the evolution of, of, of coding um, in the transition from, from a, a, a prebiotic uh, situation to a postbiotic evolutionary situation. The, the, that, that's the transition that I'm really going to focus on. Um, and these have various perspectives. The, the first one uh, is, is a kind of a catalyzed replicator system, and the second one is a, an autocatalytic network uh, model. My focus is a little bit different than these two. Uh, in particular, I'm trying to understand dynamical mechanisms that will actually uh, uh, allow us to study a transition in, uh, in enough detail so that, so that we can um, actually see the emergence of evolvability from a non-evolving system. Uh, and and uh, through a process of information se sequestration and uh, a, a process of robustification, error correction, etc. So the, dynamically I'm thinking about this as a, a transition from something like kinetics, chemical kinetics, where you have concentrations of chemicals that are interacting with each other, and typically, uh, the dynamical systems that govern kinetics uh, have uh, uh, various properties, but they're, they're basically um, attractors with long-term, statistically stable, um, measurable properties. Uh, at some point, we know that there's a, a transition from that kind of kinetic dynamical system to an evolutionary dynamical system. And it's a very, um, uh, I think we don't understand that transition. Uh, and that's what I'm trying to understand in this particular research thrust. Um, the, the way I'm thinking about um, evolutionary dynamics is that it's, it's very different from, from these kinds of attractors. Dynamical systems theory has a well-developed study of attractors, different kinds of attractors, and, and uh, characterizing different attractors with their different spectra of stability properties and whatnot. But uh, somehow, those kinds of attractors change to something else that's not really a, a, a attractor dynamics. Evolutionary dynamics has this peculiar combination of feeling sort of like an attractor um, uh, on the short term, uh, if, if you have cells or organisms, those cells and organisms develop, develop a certain um, stability, this evolutionary stability concept, so the perturbations of them tend to actually, they fix themselves. And, and uh, uh, perturbations tend to uh, get pushed back onto the same attractor. And yet, on a long term, we have some kind of instability that's leading to the generation of of innovation. And so this combination of short-term stability and long-term instability is a different kind of dynamical phenomena than attractors. And, and 
dynamical systems theory doesn't really have a, a, a great language or framework to really uh, study this uh, or describe this, this other kind of dynamical phenomena. I'm thinking of it geometrically in terms of, <coughs> of canals. Uh, so instead of just going to an attractor orbits in, in a state space, just going to an attractor and then <clears throat> having statistics defined on the attractor, uh, I'm thinking of a canal being formed in the canal. Uh, the formation of the canal is something like an attractor, but um, uh, in that in the, the orbits can going away from it tend to come back onto it. But then the canal has itself a dynamics that uh, can have this long-term instability. And, uh, and of course, you have populations of canals, and, and the canals can weave together to form ropes. Um, so that's the, 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 the geometrical picture. The mechanism that's, that we, we've uh, been working on that seems to produce this kind of transition generically, in some sense, um, is uh, uh, a dynamical mechanism that's like an alternation between unstable and neutrally stable dynamics and contracting fixed point dynamics. And so this is sort of like a, uh, there's lots of intuitions about how uh, these kinds of alternations uh, might play roles in different kinds of models for, for um, uh, transitions to the origin of life. High pools, diurnal cycles, high low temperature cycling. Another one is uh, um, uh, cycling of, of wetness, dryness, cycling. Um, so the main point though is that this, this, stable, it, <coughs> this uh, alternation actually forces the system to create these information bottlenecks. And the information bottlenecks um, uh, seem to uh, imply then the emergence of these informationally stable components that become the, the proto-code. Um, this is a code that um, uh, precedes DNA translation uh, 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 machinery. Uh, this is an example of a, uh, a model that we're actually working with. Uh, it's tends that they tend that these models tend to be spatially uh, extended. Um, it looks a little bit like a cellular automaton pattern, but at each lattice site, there's hundreds of uh, variables, and uh, the, <coughs> the, the, the symbolic state, the coarse grain state of those hundreds of variables are projected down into a color. And so you're, the different colors are different uh, 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 protogenomes. Um, so this is the end, and, and basically, I'm, I'm thinking of this first as, a, as an origin of life uh, study, but I think that this kind of dynamical phenomenon and the um, informational bottlenecks may be applicable to other kinds of transitions in evolution, like uh, it's been studied by, uh, by three of my coworkers in, in, in Tokyo uh, for the transition to multicellularity. <coughs> I think it's also applicable in, in larger scale ecological niche formation and even in evolution of cognitive mechanisms uh, like neural, uh, uh, complex neural network dynamics. And uh, so this is early days and we don't really understand this mechanism well enough to engineer it like I would like to be able to, to do, but uh, uh, I'm hopeful that, that uh, this will actually give us a way to see the emergence of, this, of this, this, the, the informational units on which uh, evolution then starts to act. That's it. Right. Thank you, Norman. Um, time for one quick question um, whilst the next speaker gets set up. Okay. No, uh, thank you very much. Um, do you have already a, a concept for the formalization of your things? Because you said this is not going to be dynamic systems language. Uh, do you have any any hint where you're going with this formally? Well, I'm starting out from dynamical systems. Uh, um, and I'm using tools from dynamical systems uh, to uh, kind of to characterize the dynamical properties of these systems as this transition occurs. Um, so I'm, I'm looking at things like uh, uh, the Apanov spectra, but not as a long-term 
um, asymptotic property, but Lyapunov spectra over a short term, and then the Lyapunov spectra actually change mm -hmm. as, as informational sequestration uh, happens, and uh, you, it kind of divides into, into uh, stable components and unstable components in the spectrum. And um, so, so I'm using some of the same, the, the tools from traditional dynamical systems study of chaotic systems, but I think that uh, I'm finding it necessary to invent new terminology for, for the evolutionary systems on the other side of this transition. And so canals as a replacement for attractors is one example of that. And uh, I'm working on the formal uh, specification of this vocabulary. Thank you, Norman. Okay, our next speaker is Nathaniel Burgo. Okay, so I'm going to say about 20 minutes worth of stuff in 10 minutes, and I hope it doesn't come across to do it on the um, So the central claim that I want to make uh, is that open-endedness, and I'll say what I mean by that, open-endedness is a property of fitness landscapes. <coughs> it's a property of the search space and not a property of the algorithm that's doing the searching. So I'll explain what I mean by that. Um, I'll say a bit about evolution and probability, which I think is hugely important. Uh, and then if there's time, I'll give an optimistic conclusion about what we can do in the future. <coughs> so I'm actually, I'm actually researching the origin of life, so I'm mostly thinking about this from the, from the biology side, but I'm going to be talking about it from the computational side. Uh, so <coughs> for me, the problem is that what we might imagine we would have when we do evolutionary computation is that we would start with simple solutions and then more complex and better ones would evolve and then more complex and so on and so on and it would keep going on pretty much forever um, <coughs> but in practice when you do genetic algorithms and so on what tends to happen is that the, the fitness and the complexity the, I'll say kind of what I mean by complexity the fitness and the complexity go up and then they saturate and then it kind of finds the best solution and it sits there <coughs> so we all believe, and I particularly do believe, uh, that ecological interactions between multiple species are really important. A few people said this morning very helpfully that they think that those things are really necessary to have open-ended evolution. And I'm going to make the counterclaim that they're not, just to see if it stands up. Um, <coughs> so, uh, so let's start thinking about fitness landscapes. So it's a kind of typical way that you might explain genetic algorithms to start with. You've got a population of individuals uh, and the, 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 the two horizontal axes somehow represent their genes, um, which is actually, this is a highly multi-dimensional landscape, but it's drawn as two. Uh, <coughs> and what happens is that the population converges. Uh, it doesn't converge directly onto the peak because it's a high-dimensional landscape and the peak takes up only a tiny volume. So it converges somewhere and then the population as a whole kind of wanders around until it finds the peak. That's not very open-ended. <coughs> but, if we try to imagine what real fitness landscapes might look like for, for something like a human being, it's totally different from that. It's not a single peak. There are many <coughs> peaks that represent qualitatively different solutions to the problem of staying alive. Uh, and the path to the peak, thank you very much, is um, it's extremely long and winding. And the idea here is that if the, if, if the space you're searching is binary strings of length 1,000, you will not sample that whole space in the lifetime of the universe, not by a long way. So we don't. So although there is eventually a peak up here, what we're observing is the kind of meandering around and getting towards the peak. Um, so we're thinking about that kind of dynamics and not about the kind of stable, attractive dynamics. <coughs> so if we want to imagine things evolving towards solutions of extreme complexity and then carrying on going for ages, well, it's actually kind of easy to imagine. That can happen as long as there are, in fact, solutions of extreme complexity that do exist. As long as those solutions are actually more fit than simpler solutions, and as long as it's actually possible to reach them through a sequence of small changes. <coughs> so basically, I'm claiming that what we should be thinking about is how to achieve fitness landscapes that have those kinds of properties, not about how to achieve <laughs> algorithms that have those properties. Um, and again, many qualitatively different solutions can be found, as long as many qualitatively different solutions exist and are reachable. So, by complexity, I personally mean, um, I personally mean kind of function, the, the way it works, the, the phenotypic complexity, how it behaves, what it does, uh, and so on, which uh, it's harder to define mathematically, but it's easy to deal with uh, on the intuitive side. 
<coughs> so now I'm going to talk about what I think is needed to get that band of fitness function that, that, that would have this open-ended property. So in the physical world, uh, so there seems to be something about physics that enables those things to exist, because biology, so for some species, certainly not for all of them, biology seems to have that property. Um, <coughs> well, the physical world has many degrees of freedom, both, uh, both in an organism's developmental process, uh, in terms of complex things in the environment that you have to learn about, uh, and, and just in terms of the, the environment itself being a very dynamical thing, which I'll kind of explain a bit about what I mean in a second. <coughs> so a degree of freedom means something like the capacity to be changed in some trivial way. So in the physical world, there are many ways in which you can slightly change something, uh, and it can actually have a non-trivial impact. So the example that I gave earlier uh, of evolving something that can fly <coughs> is kind of an interesting one because it doesn't involve interacting with a complex environment in the way that we normally think about it. There isn't like a lot of information out there in the environment that you have to learn. Uh, but there are a lot of degrees of freedom <coughs> in the sense that if you want to simulate flight, it's a fluid mechanics problem. So you've got to have this huge mesh, and you've got to have dynamical variables at every point in the mesh. It's extremely computationally complex. Uh, and I think that's actually really important because it's the fact that it's computationally complex that enables there to be many qualitatively different solutions. Uh, and it's the fact that there are many qualitatively different solutions that enables there to be a possibility of going from one type of solution to another completely different type of solution. <coughs> so that's the, end of, uh, that's the end of the bit about fitness landscapes per se. Uh, now I'm going to talk a little bit about the evolution of evolvability. I'll tie it back in together <coughs> later on. So I was thinking about uh, I was thinking about Moore's law. Um, so that's a, that's a case of exponential growth. To, really? Oh, okay, I thought I had four. Never mind. Uh, okay. Uh, uh, okay. So I was thinking about Moore's law, uh, and that's obviously the result of positive feedback. Uh, so we have to think about what positive feedbacks might exist uh, in in uh, biological systems that would enable complexity to increase. I've got some models about that, there's no time to tell you about them. One thing I do want to say, in the one minute I have left, uh, is, so there was a point earlier on about you have to hard code something. Um, and I want to claim that in the landscape of C programs, so if I have a, a string and I interpret it as a C program, I evaluate it as some task, that would normally be thought of as immensely unevolvable because any random change will just produce a syntax error. <coughs> but if the C program has the form of assign a load of random crap to a string, and then underneath that have something that interprets the string as a program in a much more evolvable language, then you have an evolvable C program. Because although you'll still die <coughs> if you get a mutation in this interpreter, you'll be okay if you get a mutation here. Uh, so <coughs> uh, many non-trivial landscapes have small regions of evolvability, which by evolution of evolvability, you might be able to find. I think this is important for my work because <coughs> life occupies a tiny region of the chemical space, and it happens to occupy a region that is immensely evolvable with all this DNA and RNA and proteins and stuff. Uh, so maybe <coughs> evolution of evolvability is actually the explanation for how life took on the form that it has in the first place. Uh, so that summarizes that. Finally, my conclusion, maybe all we need to do to get open-ended evolution is just do genetic algorithms, but with really big search spaces, really not trivial fitness functions, and really large populations, so you can get the evolution of the whole good. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, that's it. Thanks very much, Nathaniel. Time for one question. Uh, you, you seem to be talking about fitness landscapes as if they are real. Uh, and they seem to be obviously derivative, so how can you hang the importance on them? Uh, the idea is to try and abstract away, so they, obviously they aren't real, they are, they are uh, an outcome of the physical world. The idea is to, to try and take away all of the other aspects of the physical world besides, so, so I'm just sort of assuming that we're working with a system that does have a, a real fitness landscape and seeing how far we can get with that, you know, because by doing that we can probably figure out what role the other elements play. Um, <coughs> I mean, we normally assume that the fitness function is impacted by the evolving creatures within it, so it, it's hard to separate. Yeah, and I, all, I'm, all I'm doing is I'm saying let's assume that's not the case and see how far we can get. Okay. That, that, that's all. Thanks, Nathaniel. Next up, Mark Bidet. Thanks. Uh, by the way, we got the 
like the Mac system to work. So you'll get to see some huge animations. Um, I want to talk today about uh, another context for thinking about open ended evolution, which is the evolution of technology. And this work's been done uh, in collaboration with a number of people, and it's also work in progress. I'll be showing you some unpublished results, and um, you know, so it's, I'll just be sort of exposing the bleeding edge of this research project at the moment. Um, why focusing on technology? A couple reasons. Um, notice that tech, the evolution of technology is an example of cultural evolution, not biological evolution. And all the discussion we've had so far has been focused on biological evolution or models, which are somehow inspired by biology. Um, so this is different, and because it's a different kind of context. And, but still, it intuitively shows something like an open-ended evolution, if you just think about it. Um, I won't elaborate it, but, you know, there are innovations, and those can lead to new innovations, and this process keeps on, keeps on going in a kind of, uh, well, open-ended way. Technology is different from biology. Culture in general is different from biology in a number of ways. It's worth pointing out a couple of them. Uh, one is that it's hyper, what I call hyper-parental. That means a given innovation has many, many, many parents as opposed to one or two in biology. And that means the way traits flow through, through these systems is, is uh, different. Also, it's of course intentionally directed by human beings who design these things and have plans on making lots of money or buy, these, buy the widgets. Um, that's different from biology too. Uh, the, the concept of reproduction is much more indirect um, and there are other differences as well. So, I want to stress it's not like biological evolution in some non-trivial ways. Here are a couple. Uh, but the reason I want to call your attention to it is that I think it deserves to be considered as another example of open-ended evolution in its own right, along with biology. So we shouldn't, I think we should get, throw away the, the, uh, the biology blinders in a way, because I think it'll help us to learn more about the, the bigger picture, which is open-ended evolution. Um, one nice thing about cultural evolution in general, or uh, evolution technology in particular, is that it is possible to apply straightforward, familiar uh, quantitative methods to quantifying the evolution, the change in traits in a population, even though it is highly uh, hyperparental. In particular, relying on this paper by uh, Kerr and Godfrey Smith, they generalized the price equation, which you may have heard about uh, for quantifying evolution, to this hyperparental context. And you can divide the, the total change into these three components. And then in a system which is hyperparental, like this one has four parents, you can measure each of those four components as a function of time. So this is measuring the classic price equation style thing, but in a context which is hyperparental. So the point is it's, there is some kind of evolution going on, and some of the same kinds of formalism can be used to uh, quantify this. What I'm going <coughs> to talk about today is something I call reach which is a certain kind of, well, maybe it's a component of open-ended evolution. It's certainly not the, the whole enchilada, but it's, it's something to start with. And intuitively, it's the idea of an invention that has descendants that are very different from itself. So you see, you start with a certain kind of or, uh, entity, and then it leads to new entities that are quite different. And so um, it's easy to, to quantify this and measure this in various ways. So it's not an open-endedness of the kinds of individuals. There's nothing like major transitions going on here. It's all just inventions the whole time. However, the set of traits that are being present is open-ended. If you sort of think about the traits that technology has, you know, the trait <coughs> this keeps on growing in various ways. So it's a, it's a certain kind of small piece of the big picture, and we're starting here because you have to start somewhere. Um, what we're going to reach doesn't necessarily mean uh, if you have children that are very different from you, doesn't mean that they're the first ones that are like that. It's, all we're measuring is, do you have children which are very different from you? And um, as I mentioned, it's not new individuals. So we're looking at, we want to understand <coughs> evolution of inventions, and we're going to study this through the proxy of patented technology, because patent record is like an extremely detailed uh, fossil record of all of these inventions. Techno Another reason why culture is different is that, you know, biological evolution is complex, cultural evolution is more complex. And just to give you a little bit of a picture of that, you have people who, a population of human beings who adopt technologies, you know, uh, they decide to buy Macs and uh, not Windows machines, for example. You have a population of a different set of people who are inventing 
uh, technologies, and I said, you know, they have their own conscious intentions and desires that are influencing things. And then there are the population of inventions themselves that are created by or invented by those guys. And uh, they have a, a, a population of widgets that are bought and sold in the marketplace. And each one of these things are interrelated. So it's very complicated. And um, biological evolution is a little bit more like just studying one of these things. So what we're going to do is focus on that population, mainly because you have this fossil record, which is left by, there's a trace of what's going on with regard to this population. So that's where we're focusing. Not because that's the most interesting thing to focus on, but because that's the first place to start, because the data exists. So we're looking at the evolution of traits of these inventions, and what is the trait of an invention? So what we do is look in the patent record at a particular invention like this one, and we look at the, the title and the abstract. We could look at more of the text. And what we then do is just extract from this text using standard text mining methods a list of traits of these things. And there are various things one can do, look at TF-IDF or look at LDA topics. And the thing that we're actually doing is neither of those, but looking at uh, word vector representations of the style used by Google, talked about in this paper. And then we're also using some uh, community detection algorithms talked about in this paper. I'm not going to just explain them. If you're interested, you can go take a look at them. What we do with a genealogy like this, this is the genealogy for bubble jet printing. You can see it's uh, you know, five generations down, and, and some of the patents, not all of them. Um, and what we want to do is go look at each one of those nodes, which is an invention, and figure out what its traits are by extracting them using this uh, text mining apparatus. And then what we do is create this model, and uh, it's a high-dimensional model, 200-dimensional model, and we collapse it down to the three principal components of all the patents in a genealogy or a set of genealogies. And now we take those three principal components and send them to, we interpret them as RGB values, and assign a color to each node. And you can see us doing that here. We can do it globally over a huge set of patents, or ideally all the patents, or you can do it locally, like just looking at the patents in this one, and do the same thing. This tells you the difference in the content of each one of those nodes relative to each other on, on this set of genealogy.